All right, here we go. It's nice to meet you all. Uh, great for you all to be here. This is there. I, I don't know if this is going, but uh, we can figure things out. Okay, so uh, my plan today is to have a pretty casual but informative and exciting uh, discussion about Hildebrando, his life, his work, how the exhibition came about, his artist residency program that we had here in New York in April. Quite a lot to cover, some fascinating slides too. So uh, let's just get started. Welcome, Hildebrando. Great to have you here. Thank you very much, Glenn. <clears throat> I'm sorry uh, about the delay because uh, let me inform that I had a surgery uh, in, uh, in, in my leg, so I was uh, trying to rush and stuff, but it was really hard to get here, but I apologize anyway. New Yorkers walk very fast, you're just yeah. slightly <laughs> less fast. Yeah, today. I'm African. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what that means at all regarding <laughs> speed. <laughs> Okay, when you're looking at artwork that's quite different um, and new, sometimes it's hard to read it the first time you see it. So what I thought we would do is play a little game. I've taken four slides of the works that are downstairs, and what we're gonna do is say one thing that the, a viewer might look for. A technique, uh, some image that they might see, some story that might be inside of it. All right, so I'm gonna, I'll start. All right. And, uh, and we'll go. And this is going to magically work. But before you start it, yeah, I please. wanted to, to ask for something. To be more interactive with the people. If they have any questions, they can come out and get into our space. This will be much better to interact with people. It depends. Are they if nice they... people? Are they going <laughs> to Are they going to get into our face in an They ugly are Mormons. Way? They are of course they are. Good. We have quite a lot of material to cover. Let's see how that goes. We're starting a little bit late. But if we, we'll, we'll try to leave some time for yes. question and answer. Okay. Okay, so here's our little game. So, um, all right, so we're gonna look at some images. Can you, um, and we'll just say uh, one thing that you might look for, all right? This is called mustard. Um, one thing that you might look for is Hildebrando doesn't use paint brushes. Uh, some of his, his tools are um, palette knives and other metal things. That's one thing you can look for. What is one thing that in this painting that they might look and see? I, th I think that the title, it is very suggestive, by the way, by mustard, uh, <laughs> the yellow color, the yellow, car, the yellow color, um, uh, it means a lot of things. You are wearing yellow. <laughs> I must not say this. It's bad. <laughs> yeah, it's bad. He was going to talk <laughs> because about my yellow. It is madness. My mental health. <laughs> yes. And my wife so would agree with you. Reflects a little today. bit on this. Uh, All right. Here's, we'll just, what I thought would just, like, one thing for each. Okay, I'll go on this one first. Okay. This is titled Red as Blood. Quite a lot of your work um, has to do with the Bible and with God and other things. Uh, this title doesn't come from an ap apocalyptic, the moon turning to blood, but rather Isaiah's idea that we can become as white as wool, our sins can be forgiven. Is there something in there that they might see in, as they're looking at this work? Uh, the blood and uh, the beginning of the world as flesh and meat and, and us think as a human being, we share the same common thing, uh, sense that it is our blood, it is our all equal, even if you are Caucasian, African, yeah, has all these similarities. I try to avoid that uh, my process of creation in art uh, could be uh, simply. I don't want, I don't want, I, I do rather work with complexible things uh, like minimalist, like the projection of uh, suprema suprematic way in, the, in my field of Kent. But in the other way, I like to keep things very simple for people to understand me. That's why uh, has this progression of, uh, of all this body of work. All right, very good. Let me see if this works, a clicker. Okay, this is called Vorax system. What is one thing in this image that they might see? Quite a lot going on here. Uh, they might see an eye. 
that is the eye uh, that everybody seeks about since the beginning of the ages. Uh, once upon a time, we used to have uh, the sun as, a, as a, our god. And then we uh, extendably uh, developed into our days in where we have uh, the, the, the Bible, the prophets and stuff like that, and the rise of a new world and expectancy. So uh, this eye, if you look, and uh, somehow matches with the note of the United States that has an eye also. Yeah. The eye is very important because uh, my mother used to say to me that uh, the most important thing it is to look, to look into, into something and look deeply, you know? And if you see, this is what I really love about this not being so complex in my artwork, it is that um, the eye takes you about 80% of your faculties, you know, in your body. So the eye, it is a really strong stuff in the body, you know. Uh, and this all, you can see the world, you know, and the eye, it's very important. Super. Uh, in your work, another thing that you might look for is whenever there's um, black or brown sort of vertical attenuated lines, those are sort of a stand-in for, uh, for the artist or for God. So here in this case, do you see that circular eye that he's referring to? Kind of nod if you do see it. So to, the, to your right of it, there's sort of these things that look like they may be their hands, fingers that are st stretching out to his right. So that's sort of a construction then that God is building something. In this case, the kingdom of God, as you describe it to me, which is that structure below it. But let's move on to this next one. All right, what is something that they might see in this work? Uh, first of all, let me explain what we started yesterday, because uh, all of these pieces, these two of them that you have shown, it is progressively for, from a project which, which I did in the past, in 2006, where I was with the idea of creation of God, how that God created the sun, how that uh, even if it, God has brothers, even if God has sisters, even if God has some opponency, you know, because if you look into the universe, even if you look into things simple as that, you became like a hand, because the universe, it's so big, so big, so big. That's why I uh, sometimes think to myself, why do these people, they are so vain? Because they are so small, they are like, uh, you know, like sand that uh, you see walking in every direction of the world. Um, so the idea, it was to take some of these aspects of this project that I have did in 2006, and they were giving me <coughs> a lot of pleasure, because this project that I have done, that is inside of this book that, this book that I have did, of 20 years of Hildebrando de Mello, deep Hildebrando de Mello uh, works. Um, this project in particular talk, uh, talked about God and spirit, how that this translates to us, even in religions, uh, that uh, from my travelers, I've been traveling the five continents. I know mostly of uh, cultures, I started when I was very young, traveling inside of Europe. I know all Europe. And uh, in my early times, in my, in my latest time, I've been traveling to Asia, to India, to, to every part. I've been in Mexico uh, last month, and uh, they share a common, uh, truth with us. It is that the truth somehow, it is fragmented. And this is what makes the, the, the world beautiful. It is to have uh, different opinions, different, different visions, different, different perspectives. 
And I find out that the same truth that we have as Mormons, you can find it a little bit in the Hindu uh, religion. You can find it in the Bud Buddhism religion. Obviously that I'm not going to change to be a Buddhist, but you have some connection with them. And they say that Christ was all over Asia and stuff like that. So uh, to do this project, that it was Molimo, that it, it has given me a really great pleasure and uh, I don't know why, even in the exhibition, the word God has such power that all the catalogs, I made it about tons of catalogs, and they all disappear by this word, you know? It was amazing. And uh, uh, I found out myself uh, uh, to build this project that I had, Molimo. Uh, I found myself reuniting scratch, you know? that it was the ink that I was going to put on canvas, that it was the, all the elements, or even the Bible, that I was doing research uh, to the chapters of the Bible, uh, that it was in Kikongo precisely. To do this project, I had gathered all these components and all these ingredients to do this project. Yeah. Excellent. We asked you to take a short video of your work and your life and where you work and your studio so with your cell phone you took a short video it's three minutes long let's look at it i don't know if i'm in front of it I no you're good it, it, you're, it's just the bottom one. all right okay fingers crossed that this works Excellent. This is our garden. In here, we are going to see my... Let me introduce you to Mwanza. Mwanza. <laughs> that I'm working 
uh, all over my artwork. It is being developed in, and it is reaching out, out of the canvas. So it's become more. I don't know if your cell phone battery died, but that was the end of. <laughs> I thought that was fascinating to see uh, that difference. Thank you. You know, you have, the, you have these buildings that look like they could be in any American suburb on one side, and then in the distance, it was sort of, um, you know, where, where the poor live. Are they living in, like, what kind of homes? Are, are they just, are they, are they have, like, tin roofs on them and walls that they've constructed themselves? What is that? Uh, me, myself, uh, I used to live in that conditions. You know, uh, even when I finished my, my, my course in uh, Famalicão at Lameiras, when I went back to Luanda, uh, I was starting my life to build my atelier and uh, I imposed myself to not live uh, with those facilities that um, a middle or a high level class has. Your money had your, your family comes from money and you said, no, I'm gonna make it I'm gonna make it on my own. Yes. I want to show exactly. them a couple of pictures here. Uh, this is Lab Art Co. This is your new gallery space in Luanda. Luanda is the capital of Angola if that's uh, news to you. And this is right in the financial district. This is a gallery not only of your work but of other artists yes. in uh, in Africa. This gallery could fit in well in Chelsea or any yeah. major city in the world. This painting I uh, not so secretly covet, and there you are. There. Let's let's. I want to get to your your uh, your life story as quickly as we can. But before I get to that, I want to ask you about the art world in your country. Are there a lot of contemporary artists? Do you have galleries and museums where you can exhibit? And how do you fit into that world there? There's a lot of questions, but... Um, everything is starting in Luanda, and it's starting with us, because we had about 30 years of war, and the country was kind of devastated. The, um, the people who was very well trained, uh, they, they are gone, they leave the country. Oh. So we have, a very, we have a deep crisis at the moment in human resources. And uh, to start a country like this, it is, uh, it is hard. So art uh, that should play a big role on, on, on the country uh, must start already. So uh, we, uh, so in, if, if you think about this, that occurs now, uh, occurs in the, in the contemporary art world, not, not so much that an artist could have a gallery. Um, Damien Hirst uh, now, uh, nowadays has a gallery because he is very, he arranged problems with the dealers and stuff like that, and they say that uh, uh, you are taking me too much money, so I'm going to open my gallery. So, Nowadays, the, uh, Damien Hirst has a gallery, uh, but this is for uh, other reason, you know. We have galleries because we don't have a system, and the system must be built by us, because other else art will be not shown, you know. So, you got to be everything uh, in Luanda. When you do an exhibition, you are the producer, sometimes you seek for, for, for help to find a press release, Sometimes you, you know, you are, you are the artist, you do everything by, by, by your own, you know. And since uh, I always, uh, from my tender age, have this idea, had this idea that uh, uh, to give back to society what you have learned. That's why one day the son of José Eduardo dos Santos, if you allow me my, 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 this what I'm going to say that is kind of uh, not good. He was really pissed off with me, you know, because in Adina we were there and I said, no, you have the, you have uh, a really uh, high debt 
to these people like me. So they might not know that, that you might not be up on your Angolan history. Uh, uh, in, in 1975, uh, Angola finally got independence from colonial powers, Portugal. And from 1975 to 2002, civil wars raged in horrible, horrible ways. Dos Santos that you're referring to was a totalitarian leader who was just who just left power recently. Yes. So you were you were commenting on. I was commenting on with this son that it's not possible to comment. You don't you don't say these stuff to the son of dictator. You die in the first hand. So I told them in his face. We we the two of us we have a, a very high debt to this country because. We had the chance of traveling to to United States, to Portugal, to London. We have studied, we end up in good institutions and in studying. We have, uh, we have been given the chance of surviving, of not being in this war and uh, to study. So, uh, to give back you, you should give back to your community. Instead of spending those those millions that you are stolen, you know, and having nice cars and uh, being there all by your veins, uh, you should you should help to the, your community, you know. Let and uh, she, she was quite mad. Yeah, I'm sure she was. <laughs> let, let me fill in some of the blanks there. So uh, Hildebrand was the grandson of King Ukwekwe II, the yes. second a tribal uh, leader there. At age five, uh, your family, whose, uh, whose wealth came from diamonds and yes, oil industry, diamonds. at five years old, you became very ill and you were sent to live with your grandmother in Portugal. I'm going to jump ahead of some slides. Okay. We're just going to see a couple of quick things so I can get to that. Here are some exhibitions of Hilda Brando's work. There's a, uh, an installation of sculpture at the, uh, the National Airport. Here's some work in Portugal. Um, here's some work that you created in India, an artist residency program. Here's some work at Arco uh, yes, in uh, Madrid. No, Biennale uh, at Cerveira, Cerveira Biennale. Oh, was it? Yes, it was. And the then, one, it was uh, just because of my own logic, I heard about you in 2009, some friends of ours who used to live here, the Holsts, um, worked in the petroleum industry, and they were stationed in Angola. Yes. And so he wrote to me and he said, there's this guy in the branch that you should know. So that's how I first came to know you. Um, uh, we're going to jump ahead and then jump back. Okay. So then we invited Hilda Brando to come to New York for an artist residency program. In, uh, it ended up being in April that you could arrive. And you were here for 10 days. And while you were here, you know, you did most of the things that the people in this room do. You traveled on luxury transit. You uh, hung out <laughs> in cabs. You had fine dining. Yeah. You hung yeah, out with the done. locals? Yes. It is important to hang out with the locals. But... Okay, so, uh, but you made, you made work in my apartment. Here's how that worked. My wife was nice enough to leave town uh, <laughs> for 10 days, and so we moved as much furniture as we could. It's difficult to get artwork in and out of Angola, so you made all of the work that's downstairs and a few additional pieces that didn't fit in that space here, all at once, in New York. And uh, I was mentioning last night to some friends, it's not easy to get people from outside the country at this current day into this country. It's very difficult. And we worked like crazy very hard. to get you here just for 10 days and then to come back for this festival. And I have to acknowledge um, the U.S. government, Homeland Security, was very helpful, and the American uh, Embassy in, in Luanda was very helpful. Arts organizations in the U.S. kind of can guide you through some of this stuff, and they were extremely helpful. Um, and you were very helpful with patience. Okay, so that's, here's us working. I thought it might be interesting to, to show you quickly how he paints. So this is like a 30-second video of Hilda Rondo painting. So the, the surface then, this is a work of, on paper. There's already some collaged elements of uh, yellow paper and newsprint and some uh, relief uh, spraying things. But here's Hildebrando at work. Thank you. 
sort of cool. That is actually it's very generous of you to let us film that way. One of the difficulties about talking about art this way is you, you can somehow, you can somehow uh, take the mystery out of it by explaining it. And a lot of your work has a power that's kind of diff difficult to quantify. And so I, I hesitate to describe it too much. So a short clip like that is really nice uh, to see. I really thought, uh, thought of you. I thought it was nice of you to let us do that. I come from a farm family, um, which means that yeah. we know how to put in long days and work really hard. Uh, don't listen to this. I have never seen a work ethic like this. He was up at 4 o'clock every morning. At first I thought it was jet lag or something, but it wasn't. He was up at 4 o'clock every morning, at work by 5, and he stopped when the sun went down. And he, he was so focused. That it, I was so exhausted by the time you left. I, can only, I like slept for days. Um, and I also wanted to say another thing that will slightly embarrass you, but it, it speaks to your character. So we, I picked him up at JFK. We were in the cab coming here um, to where you were going to stay and work for a week and a half. And you said that you and your wife Maria had decided in advance that you weren't going to accept the uh, money that we had set aside for the residency and per diem. That instead, you would like that money to go to some future artist and a future residency. And that's the kind of person we're talking about here. Um, it's, it, it was an extraordinary generous and if I can say so, typical of the way that you worked throughout that week. So I was shouldn't say that. That's why I didn't want you to listen, because I knew you would try to disclaim it. Some of you have uh, really bad geography skills, so you might want to know where Angola is. So here's Africa. In the center af of Africa, on the, uh, the Pacific coast, is Angola. So there's, what did I say, Indian Ocean? I, I meant to say. Something I didn't say? The blue area on the left is close to Angola. Luanda is the capital there. He was born in Wambo, which is just a little bit inward. Luanda, just so you know, is one of the most expensive cities in the world. It's more expensive than New York City to live, uh, probably because of oil, yes, workers, and, and, and others. And we don't have any industry, so we buy everything from outside. Right. And uh, when you were five years old, you went to live in Portugal. And you ended up in the city of Porto, which is there, in the north. toward the north. And you stayed there until you were 18 years old. At the time, I'm kind of jumping ahead, of not letting you speak, but uh, New Yorkers are also fast talkers. We, yeah. we think of ourselves as being very efficient for doing that, which is probably not accurate. Um, one of the things that you missed in part, but obviously not the ramifications of it, was the Angolan Civil War. And uh, it raged on for a long, long time. You went to live with your grandparents, grandmother and uncle and aunt and some relatives, but your parents and siblings stayed in Angola. And I don't know exactly why, but at the age of 18, you decided to jump right back into the, one of the hottest spots in the world for danger. Why did you come back to Angola and decide to return and live there? I think that um, I'm a bit crazy. <laughs> and that's why I paint like I paint. That's why I do the, the stuff that I do. I have one thing that uh, I promised to myself since I was very young. Um, it is not to have a, a mediocrity life, you know. I wanted to spend all my days when I am here in Earth having a really good time, you know. That's why I did so much stuff in my role that uh, they were kind of very crazy somehow very stupid, but lead me into this person that I am today. I have a lot of stories, even as an African. Do you knew that I was in London without a visa and the guys let me in? When? When, when was that? It was in 2000 and something. I went to London without a visa. Could you imagine this, being an African and how the that British people are strictly about 
uh, laws and stuff like that. I was there and I entered the country. That was crazy of me, you know, because... Well, I'm not too judgy, but it does sound slightly crazy. Yes, I, it I, is. I, <laughs> I do want to mention your grandmother, so your grandmother was living in Porto there, and it was she who welcomed the, mission, the Mormon missionaries yes, it was. into the family, and everyone there joined the church. So you were a young man. Not only my teenager. family, other families too, because my grandmother has this energy that it was surpassed somehow to me. That is why I'm so crazy. This is came from the family after all. <laughs> <laughs> so my, my uh, and uh, yes, it was because if you see my aunt, uh, used to do business uh, with Mobutu, the dictator from the Republic Democratic of Congo, and they they were they were crazy women. They were they didn't have cause and stuff like that. They were all the way by them fit, you know, strictly to the Republic of Democratic of Congo. By them fit, they were crazy women. And imagine me nowadays in modern times, as, uh, modern times that I have buses, planes, and stuff like that to catch. It's obvious that the, unit, the that the road it's very small for me. I had I need more more space, you know. But but still, regarding the danger, why go back? It would oh, have been very, uh, it would have sorry. Been very let me ask you to that question. Um, I felt that somehow uh, that. Uh, I had a lot of aspects uh, to respond to that question. Um, one, of, uh, one of the main aspects, it is that uh, I was took out of my father and my mother uh, in very tender age. So uh, I was in the school most often and sometimes uh, when comes the day when father has to go to school, and see how his son it is doing. I do this a lot of times to my, to my sons nowadays, and I know the value of such thing. But I didn't have that thing, you know. And I was forgetting about of the face of my father and uh, mother because it surpassed so much years. Uh, and I was living with my aunt, my uncle, and my cousins, and my my grandmother and. Uh, uh, lastly, my grandmother passed away. Um, so one of the reasons was to meet my father, to meet my mother. It was a uh, totally, it was not good because when I arrived, I thought that my father, that my mother was still alive, and uh, it wasn't. So, uh, so I was in uh, at 12 years old. I was in the, uh, I started, uh, I was in the fifth grade or something, and uh, I was with the good notes on school. I was a, a kind of, uh, I was a good student. Uh, by the age of, of 12, I was already speaking in English, uh, writing and stuff like that. By the age of 13, I, al I was already speaking uh, about five languages or something. I was starting to speak language because of the influence and the people and the Mormons and stuff like that. I learned, I learned the things since I was very young. Everything is, was very quick to me, you know. Uh, that's why I, I, uh, people, uh, I need about six months, three months to learn something. Quickly, I uh, always learn. So one of the reason it was this one, one of, uh, the other reason it is that I have already spoken about that I'm crazy, you know. I, I waited, uh, you know, I waited, I don't, I don't know, um, for you to be older in Portugal, you have to be, to have 18 years yeah, that's old. Right. I don't know what is. Yeah, there's the, a similar thing here. It's so here. You, it's so the same. You, that so. was the that was the minimum age that yes. you could leave, and yes. it was like your birthday and you left. Yes. <laughs> it's, it's so I was 17 today, and I bought a ticket, you know, and uh, uh, I ran away home, and I said to my aunt, um, "Tomorrow I'm going to leave to Angola." She said, "What?" Where did you find the ticket and the money? 
And I said, I work it. You work it. Yes, I did some business there with, uh, with textiles and stuff like that. I'm going to Luanda tomorrow. You are crazy. All those people, they are getting out of there and uh, they are suffering and they are killing themselves. And you want to go back? Yes, I must go back, you know. And I, I don't know, I had that feeling that uh, I, was, I wanted to go back. You know, the reaction from people in Angola had to be just astonishment that you would come. We, we, we would say here in the US that you had major street cred yeah. coming back. And to amp up the, uh, the risk factor, the works that you created when you first came back were quite political. I'm going to kind of walk through some of these quickly because we're, we're going to run out of time if I don't. Here there's like a, an equation in purple, zero divided by, and then there's sort of a glass. What's in that glass? Cockroaches. Cockroaches yes. equals Angola. The idea then that, these, that the people of Angola were treated badly and yet you were in glass so you could see what was going on. Here's another image. These are birds, what are they called? Uh, they umbi? call it the umbi umbish, that it is a bird. Uh, umbi umbi birds in Angola are traditional bringers of good news. In this image, the birds are cannibalizing each other. A, a sort of a, a metaphor for what's going on in civil war. This is a Kandam Gairo, which is a public bus. It's like a privately owned yes. bus. Uh, at the time, there wasn't, you know, public transportation, so, these, so everybody got around on these buses. To sh just to show you a little bit, here's one drawing. Here's how that same image, painted the same year, is a little bit more abstracted. You can see some sort of circular wheels there and the same sort of coloration and some of the shapes. That's kind of a clue of, some, how, of some of the ways that your work develops from one medium to another. Some of your work uh, has animals, um, insects, trees and others. Here is um, Karapau, which is mackerel. Yeah, let me uh, think about, let me you, speak you a little stand? bit Go about this Karapau. Uh, Karapau, it, it is um, a face of a wood fish. I don't know if you have, you call it wood fish? We have a Not fish. fisherman, don't know. Yes, that is called Karapau. And uh, uh, kara, kara de Pau, uh, translated in other sense, it is a person that uh, does bad to other persons and stays with the same face, like nothing, you know. Something. Yes, that's it, thank you. So, uh, people from politicians in, uh, I don't know, I, I find uh, nowadays that is all over the world, but uh, I can find, I can only speak about my my, my reality, that it is yes. Luanda. Um, they have this cut of the pau, you know? They were there with uh, stolen money from the people, big cars, big, big houses, uh, their, them sons studying outside of the country, and people starvated to war. Uh, this was bad, you know, that's why I did those to call them attention. And we were discussing this also in dinners and stuff like that. One of my collectors says that, uh, Ilda Brando, nowadays you are a, a big, you are a big conversation in our tables when people are eating. Because people who bought me painting from this uh, side to side, it was people who had some income real income. So, uh, yes, it was a bit like this. As some of the works that I do by series of projects have this duality of being uh, progressively politically, but in a smooth way, not uh, impact, because other else I would, uh, you, I would uh, I would go to prison, like I faced it several times. Well, let's talk about that briefly. There were consequences. You know, we talk about art as being valuable or being meaningful, but there's a big risk in making art that means something. And you've been beaten, you've been imprisoned, yes. you've been poisoned, you've been falsely inc incarcerated, uh, all in retribution for some of these works. As time went by, the works have, not, have been less political on the surface, but still with the resonance of it. 
Here's an image that has a spider. In Angola, there's a legend, like a folkloric story, of a, a character named Anansi, who is a spider who can take human form. And uh, so a spider in the US might be seen as kind of a creepy, crawly thing, but there is a figure of strength and agility. And so then, as a metaphor, a spider is sort of like Angola that can change. And you're, you're, the question you're posing in works like this is, can Angola change? Can it reinvent itself? Can it transform? Yes. Uh, the, one of the question it is that, and one of the question that building all, um, to make all uh, this uh, series of work that I've said, the duality of the purpose, purpose himself, it is that uh, also my, f my grandmother, uh, we used to have uh, a kind of uh, spiritual thoughts about animals and they kind of passed this situation through us. Uh, they used, uh, my grandmother teach me when I was very young that uh, Okay, don't kill the spiders, because the spiders, they are the money, the symbol of money. If you kill spiders, one day you will going to be poor, for sure. Because they have this capacity of, uh, 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 of doing them work by capturing animals. And that crosses, that things that they do, they are the symbol of money. Please don't kill them. <laughs> so I was, you know, I was uh, um, growing with all these uh, these things surrounding me that was surpassed by generation by generation. Your artwork includes, um, you know, insects and animals that uh, are known to your country, but also plants. Here is a baobab tree, Imbondiro tree. And these are legendary. I don't know if you've seen them. They, they grow throughout Africa. The diameter of these trees is this room. So that's the size of these trees. And they can grow up to 100 feet high. And here is an image of one of these trees. Can I speak a little bit about this? Uh -huh. Yes. Please do. Uh, this, uh, I must speak about it because uh, somehow confront us, you know, uh, as two human beings that. Uh, they find each other and somehow they have friendship and somehow that the color, the race doesn't mind, you know. And uh, I'm going to invite you to know the story of this painting. I have a big friend of mine that it is called by Vergizas. Vergizas in Spanish, it is a um, a symbol like that one that you see there uh, by the Italian, uh, by the Italians, uh, that it means also family. So, since I have a huge, tremendous uh, friendship with this guy, I um, I painted this this artwork that symbolizes somehow his family. All of these eyes. It is them family. It so is the white things are eyes yes, coming down it, from the limbs of the Yes, tree. it is eyes. So the two eyes on the bottom, it is the couple. The three eyes on there, uh, they are the sons. And the other eyes, they are um, his father and mother. So it, this was done in a very abstractive way. Uh, and a lot of things they are hiding. And uh, this painting of mine somehow symbolizes what I call it friendship that is forever. Very nice. I also wanted to show how a similar image, kind of uh, how you, you drew a similar image but in a different style. Here is another baobab tree, but it's flattened uh, a little bit more, right? This is uh, collage. Yes. yes, but the but the image, I mean the it's still everybody a tree. thinks that it is a painting, but you must say that it is a collage. Thank you. This is a picture of uh, Elder Holland and Elder Christopherson um, dedicating 
Angola to the preaching of the gospel and they're standing in front of yes, one of these trees. So um, we have no more time, but what I would like to encourage is this is the friendliest guy on the planet. You Ugh. should just come up <laughs> and just chat, chat him up. Um, you know, wherever we've gone, you have just been so generous with your time. You're talking to people who are like hot dog vendors and finding out their whole family story and asking people where they live in the city and, you know, uh, just your curiosity is, is just wonderful and I want to commend you for that. Um, the center also published an exhibition catalog for your show oh, this, um, called the um, Mzambi is God in, yes. in Kikongo. Kikongo. Yes. Which is the, uh, what, the, it the is language the first, of uh, uh, first uh, translated Bible uh, in a dialect, in an African dialect. And those collage images that you see there, those are pages from the Old Testament in Kikongo. Yes. The exhibition catalog is available downstairs and it includes an essay that kind of puts into context this work, an extended interview, and all of the images that are in the exhibition and that you made at the center. So I want to thank you so much for being here and thank you very much for being thank here today. Thank you very much. Thanks everybody. Thank you. It's been a great pleasure.